Welcome to the Magic Hour, a safe haven for lost stories and curious folk. Today, I am going solo with my friend Vanessa, who's been on the podcast before. Uh, Vanessa just went through a wild adventure with her beloved dog, Yukina, and we decided that it needed to be recorded on the Magic Hour. So um, I am going to let Vanessa get right into her story about her dog and what happened a few weeks ago or days ago, even. I think it was weeks ago. Yeah, about a week and a half. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to tell our story. Yay. Okay, so gather around, everyone. <laughs> this is the story of two very good friends, myself, Vanessa, and Yukina. <laughs> so I met Yukina when she was three weeks old. She's a little dog. She looks like shaped like a fox. <laughs> and when I met her, she was so little you could I could fit her in the palm of my hand. She has little brown eyebrows. She's black, fruit bat ears, <laughs> and little brown paws. And Yukina and I have been through all kinds of adventures. She's quite a survivor. She's got a lot of dignity and she is very sweet. And she has survived cancer and she's fallen off very high places and come out unscathed. And she used to be able to jump over any fence, no matter how high. And as she's aged, she has, she's arthritic. She's very slow now. She walks very slow. <laughs> and she can pretty much not really hear much. She's mostly deaf. She can see okay. Her smelling, her smell's not that great anymore. But she has a great spirit. She's very much enjoying life, and she loves to go for hikes. So she goes for hikes very slowly. She's also a little senile, but <laughs> she kind of knows what's going on. She just gets disoriented sometimes. Yeah. So Yukina, the elder doggy, and her daughter, Alosa, and myself and my father went for a hike in the very vast wilderness in early September, and it was a Nice, beautiful day. It was very hot and very humid. Probably almost 90 years old. No, 90, 90, 90 years degrees. old. <laughs> <laughs> and we walked to, we had been working on a cabin and we were almost ready to go back and we decided to go for a walk. So we walked to this beaver dam, about a 10 minute walk. And there's no trails in this forest. It's all wilderness for thousands of acres. Wow. And it's marshy and the mosquitoes are epic. They, there are clouds of mosquitoes on a day like this. So we were walking to the beaver dam. And as usual, Yukina was about 20 paces behind, walking very slow. And because there was no trail, I was stopping, as usual, very frequently, turning around and checking for her. And many times she was going, kind of trying to head in a different direction. So I would get crouch down and wave my arms and she would see me and she would look relieved and she would turn around and start going the right direction. So we continued this way until we got to the beaver dam and I looked back. She was about 20 feet behind me and I looked at this gorgeous pond with lots of dead trees from the beavers. I was looking for blue heron nests and checking out the dam and in the few minutes that I was doing that, unbeknownst to me, Yukina must have lost sight of me and wondered where I was. So I turned around and she was gone. God, nowhere to be seen. So I looked around. My father went one direction. I went to another. But the problem was we could get lost in the wilderness. There were no mm -hmm. trails, no markers. And my father, when he was a teenager, had gotten lost in the same woods. Wow. For a very long time and he had to spend the night in the woods so he had his own reason wow. for really not wanting to lose me as well so we would do small circles around where we lost her honestly for how slow she walks I thought I would find her pretty quickly but yeah you know, she had sometimes she gets determined and she had walked diligently in one direction or another and I had no wow. idea what direction that was my dad insisted that she might have gone back to the cabin. 
I was skeptical of this because she really didn't know where she was. <laughs> right, right. And her smell was not very reliable these days. So we walked back to the cabin and she was not there. <laughs> so this was about 4 p.m. We spent about an hour looking around in the woods. I called her, but I kind of knew she wouldn't hear me because she can't really hear my voice. She doesn't really hear clapping. So every now and then she'll hear a very loud noise, but I seem to not be able to make any noise with my voice or body that she can hear. After a little while, my dad was saying kind of defeatist things like, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think we're going to find her. There's so much wilderness here. And I drove up and down the road because there's one area she could have gone in a certain direction that she would have ended up on the road, but she wasn't there. Went back to my car. So I called my aunt and my uncle who lived down the, about a mile down the road. And I was in tears by this point. And I was also covered in dirt from cleaning. And my aunt convinced me to come to her house, take a shower Mm. regroup and I was wailing in the shower I was just wailing and um, I got out of the shower got dressed and I went out and my uncle and my dad and my aunt were talking and we decided to all go back together and search for her now it's about an hour away from dark and I was pretty insistent that I didn't want it to get dark without us doing everything we could yeah to search so we went back And we got probably like, you know, 20 mosquito bites each looking around. We went off in different directions and I actually had a ability to get reception so I could see where I was in relation to my car on my phone. And I I made a little bit of a loop. Um, I thought maybe she went towards the creek because she kept, that was often where she was going when she went in the wrong direction. Yeah. And so I went in that direction. We all went in different directions. We were looking. And still no Yukina. So it got started to get dark, and my dad kindly agreed to stay at the cabin overnight in case she came back. Um, And my aunt and uncle said they would come back the next morning and help us look. So I decided to go back to Ithaca because I was a mess, and my family were already saying things to me like, she had had a good life. He He gave her a good life. Oh. And maybe she had gone off, you know, she's 16 and a half. Maybe she went off to die. This is not the worst way to die. But I knew that she did not go off to die because it, I know dogs do that sometimes, but I could just tell she was trying to stay with us and that she was happy as a clam on our, on our hike. So I couldn't really handle being there at night, not being able to search for her. So I drove back an hour and a half to where I live. And I talked to my friend, Laura, and she, while we were talking, I talked about how I wish we could, I could just hire a police with a canine unit dog to sniff her out, but I don't think that they would use those resources on a very old senile dog who was lost in the wilderness on Labor Day. And, my, and we kind of discovered that they do have tracker dogs, dogs who find dogs. So I, I emailed them and I looked around. It looked like they were only in Connecticut and Maine were the closest ones I could find. So Mm. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to pull it off. (laughs) And it was about like $500 to hire one, but I didn't care at that point. Yeah. So then my sister called my older sister, Allison, and she, she admitted to me later that she actually didn't have a lot of hope. But when she heard of the idea of tracker dogs, she was like, huh, maybe that could be a, a beacon of hope there. And she is an amazing researcher. She has amazing powers in this way. So she found a network of people who train tracker dogs of all kinds, including little ones, big ones, to sniff out deer who are injured after getting shot for, by hunters. And they do this voluntarily, although you usually tip them. So, um, and they usually work during hunting season. And my sister found me like 19 phone numbers of people who wow. claimed to work in this area that, I, that she was lost in. And so one of them was a female, Pauline. And I thought I would try her first because I don't know if I was going to be walking around in the woods by myself. I thought it would be nice to be there with a female. So I would try mm-hmm. her first. But 
I, I, I was praying that someone would help me and my family was all sending me good, good energy and prayers, my friends. And I really didn't know if I was going to be able to get any sleep. But after I had this, this plan, I was able to get a few hours of sleep between crying and cuddling my other dog, Alosa, who had up to this point been pretty happy, but I think she could tell something was wrong because she was acting sort of sad and sticking by me a lot. And I just kept looking at Yukina's bed and I was just, I couldn't help but imagine like what life would be like without her. And I felt this deep darkness because I didn't know where she was and I was facing the possibility of never knowing, never knowing the end to Yukina's story, my, my very, very dear friend. And that was a hard thing to even put my head around. So I was thinking, I didn't know. And school was supposed to start on Tuesday. I'm starting, I was starting as an art teacher my first day of the school year. And I was thinking that I might have to take a leave of absence. I, I, my priorities were razor, razor sharp to finding Yuki. Mm-hmm. It would be one thing if she, if she died tragically, that would be hard enough, but not knowing where she was, knowing she was out there somewhere. I was not going to abandon her. So I was going to do what it took to keep searching until there was no hope or until I found her one way or the other alive or otherwise. Yeah. So I got a few hours of sleep. I woke up on my own around six in the morning, which you know me, that's not typical for me. No, it's not. Yeah. Um, I like to sleep in a little. And I made some coffee and I, I, I called animal control just to check to see if anybody found her because about there were a couple directions she could have gone that maybe she would have gone to somebody's property and my aunt and uncle had called their neighbors and told them about that but the vast majority of directions would have taken her for thousands of acres to nothing but wilderness and there were coyotes around and porcupines and this is real real wilderness out there so I the first person I called as soon as it was almost eight o'clock I thought about it but maybe that's late enough Mm -hmm. I called Pauline and Pauline answered and she said she had just woken up and she I told her my story told her the situation and she said listen I have to tell you that with older dogs I know a lot of trackers we've never found an older dog alive Mm -hmm. she gave me she said told me about a couple older dogs they had found dead but she said, with elder dogs, and we've never once found one alive. And in my mind, I was thinking, well, maybe Yuki will be an exception. You haven't met her. Because she <laughs> has this amazing will to live. She's just been through a lot of things. And she's a pretty amazing dog. She's a real survivor spirit in a calm way. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, she found out that she only had to travel an hour, 45 minutes. And she said she had been, Pauline had been working until midnight the night before. Wow. And she had to work that same day. And she was like, it's Labor Day. But she had a, in just a moment, she said, you know what? Let's go. We got to go before it gets hot. Because once it's hot, my, my dogs can't track as well. And we just, we have to go. So I'll meet you there. I'll meet you there at, you know, around nine or so. And so it was on. She, she agreed wow. to do it. And she told me later, she said, I don't think you're going to find anybody else who's going to go out on Labor Day. Yeah. An 88 degree day. So I jumped in the car. I, my dad was still there. He had apparently been shining the, the high beams as much, you know, often into the woods at night in case Yuki saw the light. No, Yuki and I, I got to the cabin a little bit before Pauline, my aunt and uncle were there, Don and Keith, and they had been searching for an hour, bless them. <laughs> and so my dad was waiting for her at an intersection because this place is, there's not even really a, an address. And, um, but when she showed up, my aunt and uncle left and my uncle left a handful of cat food because they have cats <laughs> on the, on the store, on the step to the cabin. And he said, I believe in miracles before he left, which I thought was really sweet. I love that. So I went out with Pauline, Pauline, uh, had two dogs, um, and they were wire hair adoptions. 
thoughts. So they're little. I was they're imagining little, big dogs. Yeah. No, they're little. They're little doggies. <laughs> and Braley and Bruno were their names. Braley was older and she knew how to track. Bruno was in training and he didn't seem like he really knew what he was doing yet. <laughs> so I had brought some fur from Yuki because I had brushed her the day before to sniff. And Braley sniffed it and Bruno didn't even sniff it. <laughs> so we went out. And immediately, Braley kind of went off in a different direction, like not even the way we had gone. So I was kind of like, oh, I wonder if she knows what she's doing. But she probably was following a deer trail because she's trained to follow deer trails. Yeah. So Pauline called her back. Bruno was on a leash. Braley usually doesn't run away. So she was not on the leash. We went to the place where we had last seen Yukina by the beaver dam. And my dad had spent the morning like cutting a trail, like bushwhacking a trail for us. Which is, which That's really amazing. Cool. And mm-hmm. once we got there, Rayleigh started going off in a direction up the hill away from the creek. And so we followed her and we followed her and we followed her and she went in zigzags. And then we got to a tr- like a fallen tree and she just ran away. <laughs> <laughs> And about that time, my dad kind of came through the woods because I think he was worried that we were going to get lost. So she was not happy that Braley ran away. Yeah. And it was it was very hot. There were a lot of mosquitoes, and she was worried about Braley. And she called her and called her, and she did a dog whistle, you know, when you put your fingers in yeah. your mouth. And she was whistling and whistling, and then she had a hard time listening because Bruno was panting so much. So she asked my dad to take Bruno on the leash and myself to walk back to where the beaver dam was because then she could listen better. And she whistled and whistled and whistled. And then Bruno started barking his head off so loud. Like my ears hurt. And finally, I don't know. I don't know how long it was, maybe after five minutes or 10 minutes, uh, Pauline comes back holding Braley, (laughs) who's panting. And she says, I found her, but she's done. She's done for the day. She's and I guess tracking really takes a lot out of them anyway. Yeah. And she didn't want to lose her dog. She was saying things like, I don't like this. Yeah. So she was like, I'm gonna take Braley back to the car and turn the AC on and then I'll come back and we'll, we'll you know, we we already searched this direction. Let's go across the creek and go we'll spread out with an earshot and we'll do a circle around there. So I sort of like my heart sank a little bit because I thought, well, Braley took us in this direction. Yeah. I think he's in this direction. And also we were losing our tracker dog. Right. So, you know, but I thought, you know, at least we can do some searching in a way that my dad feels comfortable with because that was a big inhibitor, you know, rightly, I'm sure, because we didn't want to get lost ourselves. But yeah. So as soon as we're about, so she went to go take Braley to the car and I hear something from the distance about the same direction that Braley had taken us. I hear, (laughs) <laughs> and I looked at my it was so far away and I looked at my dad and I said dad did you hear that and he said what was that I said I think it was Yukina and I have to tell you my heart I have, can't even describe this feeling I was filled with hope I was just my entire body was smiling yeah and I and I said dad please let me go run off in that direction and he said you know what you'll hear this yippee dot you'll find us just go go as long as you need to go as far as you need to go which was very different from anything he had said yeah. before. Yeah. So I ran off in that direction as like, fast as I could, running through the forest, elated. And I don't even know how long I ran for. I don't remember where I went. I was like in a different state. Mm. And so I actually, a, a branch snapped from the ground and kind of brushed my leg. And I remember thinking, oh, you better slow down. You don't want to fall and injure yourself. Yeah. And later I found this, it actually is like, this. it ripped my pants and left a huge bruise on my leg, but I didn't notice any of that at the time. And um, finally I came to a marsh, probably like a five acre marsh with uh, reeds and a little bit of trees in the middle, a little island of trees. And there was a hill to my left and a hill to my right. And I looked over to the right, and I'm calling Yuki now, even though she probably can't hear me. I'm calling to the left. I look to the left, and I couldn't figure out which hill I should go to. And then I heard, crack. 
crack, really loud cracks, like a, like almost like a human was in the marsh. So I even called out, hello? Like I thought it might be a person. But it was a big animal walking very slowly in the marsh. <laughs> so I looked and I saw about probably about 100 feet in, I saw a reed, the top of a reed. It was like a little tuft of grass kind of thing. It wiggled just a little in like an unnatural, like not like it wasn't wind. And then I saw another reed wiggle a little bit. And that was it. That's all I saw. No, no other movement, no other sound. But as soon as I saw that wiggling, the second wiggling reed, I plowed in with my muck boots and I like ran into the, to the marsh and just swatting reeds left and right, went straight to where I thought I saw the reeds wiggle. And then I stopped. And I looked around, and about three feet away, behind some reeds, I saw Yukina's rib cage. <laughs> and she was just standing there, stoically staring off into space. <laughs> so I can't even describe the emotion I felt at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think I, I felt so elated. I guess that's the word I can use. I yeah. was elated. I was so happy. It was like, I felt like the, so much grace from me. It was, it was just like, oh, I couldn't believe it. It was so sweet. And it's like I could have gone in one direction in my life that could have been a mental health spiral. It could have messed up my job. like, Or I could have gone in this direction and found this, this bitch, <laughs> <laughs> which I like to call my dogs because they are, they are female dogs. They're male bitches. <laughs> So I don't know if I can swear on your podcast, but it's, it's actually totally fine. Really swearing because it's a female yeah. dog. <laughs> Just totally like the was really a damn. <laughs> I love it. So of course I, I went over and I grabbed her and she kind of like jumped. Like she didn't really notice me until that moment. <laughs> I scooped her up. I, I gave her a cuddle. I said, Yukina, Yukina. Oh, I checked. I kind of checked her ears. I checked her. She wasn't even that dirty. She had like a little bit of dirt on her butt. She was just standing in the marsh. She was just standing there. She was fine. She didn't have any injuries. And I ran out of, the, I held her in my arms and I ran out of the marsh and I got to the, to the back to the forest. And it was actually a really nice open place right before the marsh. And I set her down to see if she could walk. And she walked like totally normally, like really slow, but she seemed fine. She didn't have a lamp or anything. And at this point, my dad's yelling for me. And so I started yelling back, I found her, I found her and she's okay, <laughs> over and over again. And finally, my dad heard me and he was like, where are you? Do you need help? And I was like, no, but I could use help carrying her yeah. <laughs> because, because of the mosquitoes, which I still got so many mosquito bites that day, but I was wearing really thick khakis. I had wool socks, I had muck boots, I had a t-shirt and a sweater. Actually, the T-shirt was from my grandpa's old T-shirt, which I had never worn before. He used to live around there. He's That's since interesting. Passed. And I was wearing a sweater and a rain and a raincoat because mosquitoes have trouble getting through the raincoat. So I was wearing like basically what a wrestler would wear if they were trying to lose weight and going for a run. <laughs> and I was run. I had run through the marsh. I'd holding this forty-pound dog. I'd run up this hill, and I was actually quite tired already. Yeah. So my dad came and carried her the rest of the way back to the cabin and Pauline was with us and Bruno was with us and I was just, everybody was so happy because I think, I think, you know, it has, it has a happy ending. And I was thinking at that point, like, oh, all the people that I told about this who are waiting to hear, they're all going to get a happy ending. <laughs> so, cause it really could have gone either way. Yep. And so I, I said to, so I really credit the tracker just to a large extent, even though technically they didn't find her. Braley took us in the right direction the and right then direction. ran away. And then we made a whole bunch of noise. Yeah. So I think even though she's mostly deaf, I think she heard the dog whistle. I think she heard the barking really loud. And I think that inspired her to bark. Yeah. To let out it, a bark. To make a sound. Yeah. So um, I said... Um, something about Pauline being our hero, and at that because me, I don't know. Maybe she was wondering if I what I thought about that. And so then she said, "Can I take a picture for my brag wall?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, of course." So when we got back to the to the cabin, um, we got a picture of my dad and Bruno because Braley was already in the car, 
and you if can, you're, if you're okay with this i'm gonna share this picture yeah oh god yeah. the smile i have on my face i think can give you a sense of how i felt and it's a great picture she has a big smile on her face too all the yeah she does she's probably honestly she's probably just hot and panting but she was she was very i mean she i'm sure she was well i don't know how she felt but i can only imagine she was happy and relieved so and yeah and i and i told my dad he was my hero too because he you know he had I mean, he was supposed to go home the night before and he really helped a lot. So, so that was, um, really exciting. And then we got to calling some family members and my, my dogs ate the cat food. <laughs> I, Alosa had been in the cabin at this point because I didn't want her to distract the efforts. And yeah. she was so, she was so excited to see Yuki. It was oh. really cute. She was like jumping around and really, really happy. So they, we were all reunited and I just, before we end the story, I want to imagine what Yukina must have gone through. I don't know what she went through, but I imagine that she probably did go off in that direction. She might have gone up the hill because at my house, often when we go for a hike, it's right up a hill. So yeah. she might associate uphill with finding mama. Yeah. And I think she probably did go in zigzags. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I asked my dad, were there coyotes? Because. I didn't, you know, I had this feeling that she wouldn't get eaten by a predator um, that night, but it certainly could happen eventually. Yeah. I just had a feeling that they, you know, she's not really on the menu usually. It's not their normal. And I just had a feeling she would at least be able to survive one night without getting chopped. And I have to say, though, she is not equipped to live in the wilderness by herself. She maybe could have in the past, but. She is just between being disoriented sometimes, really slow, arthritic, deaf, not being able to smell very well. She really um, just isn't, that's not what she's equipped for. She has a really good life here with me taking good care of her and going on little walks, but um, she's not really made for the wilderness anymore. And... At the same time, she I think she must have had some good instincts because at some point in her wanderings, she decided to go into the marsh. Yeah. And maybe she stumbled into the marsh herself. Maybe she decided to go in there. But that was a good move because, first of all, it was so hot. Yeah. So it kept her cool. She went down and she must have bedded down into the marsh. And it probably kept her scent from the, from the predators. She probably was hidden. She was well hidden. Yeah, because my family members had walked by that place a few times. Wow, that mar- same marsh. Um, I don't know how far away it was from where we originally found her. Uh, maybe about oh, I don't know, six hundred to nine hundred yards, something like that. I'm not very good with the distance, but it was a ways. But it was, you know, it was less than a mile. And I think that maybe even laying on her tummy and. In the marsh, might have kept the mosquitoes from biting her tummy or her bottom half. She had a lot of mosquito bites in her ears. And I was just imagining her that night, like getting bitten by mosquitoes. And yeah. And I, I wonder if she was feeling like, I wonder if she was feeling her resoluteness that she often has. That she was just going to do what she needed to do. Um, a lot of people consider that she must have been scared. I don't know if she got scared. I think she might have gotten concerned because it was nighttime and and she was, you know, alone. Alone and I'd never left her overnight before. Um I hope she didn't consider in her dog way that I might have left her because she was old. I don't think so. Of course I don't know what my dog felt, but I tend to think that she just kind of knowing her that she just kept going. Like the next thing, next thing, what do I do? And the, she sounded a little sad when she barked her bark, but it, it wasn't like a totally sad cry. It was just like a bit of a howl. I think she had, she would probably started to get stressed out at some point. Yeah. Um, and she also, she was standing, even though she was really tired when I brought her back. And I think she just kind of kept, kept like, her survival instincts. She's like, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep standing. But I think she must have spent that night sleeping in the marsh. Yeah. She must have fallen asleep at some point. And when she got home, she was so tired. She was definitely a little wobbly more than usual. And, you know, I pet her so many times, gave her so many kisses. 
And she ended up sleeping for about most of the day. And she slept a lot for a couple of days. And I eventually I brushed her, I gave her a bath. She's very shiny and clean right now. <laughs> she did have quite a bit of dirt kind of hidden in her fur, especially around her, her little butt. <laughs> and um, over the next few days, she really started to come back to her normal functioning of being able to walk with us and stay with us. And she wasn't sleeping as much. And um, she's pretty much like totally back to normal now. And I, I was a little afraid she might be traumatized by the situation, but she does not seem traumatized. <laughs> She is, she's great. She's a, I like to call her like a spelt little badass bitch. <laughs> she, she survived the wilderness at age 16 and a half. How much is that in human years? Is that like? Well, according to a chart at the vets is about 90. So it's funny that wow. I said 90 years instead of 90 degrees. Yeah. Um, and it was already <laughs> almost 80 degrees, by the way, speaking of degrees, by the time we found wow. her. And, um, yeah, I, I really didn't, and I had to set up my classroom. Like I didn't think I was going to have time to do that. I ended up getting home by like one and still having time to go set up my classroom, my art room. And it was, it just felt like a miracle. Like it felt like grace and I'm not a particularly religious person. I am pretty, there's some really spiritual people, not religious, but I just really felt that. And I'm, I, I honestly, at this point, I, it's been a week and a half and I still feel like I, my body was humming for days and I, I still feel that nothing short of a tragedy can bring me down. It like sharpened my focus or in, in this way, my perspective. And I have just felt grateful. And every time I look at her, I'm just so happy that she's with us. And, you know, my, my dad said something, which the way he phrased it was funny, but he said, she could die tomorrow and it would be okay because at least you would know she would die with <laughs> you and you would know what happened to her. But it's true. And yeah, I mean, I was like, well, I hope she doesn't die tomorrow, but it, it, like, it, there is a truth to it. And it's, I was telling you, I think that after she had cancer and, and I was told by two, two vets that she would, I'd be lucky if she lived six months and, and she lived to, she overcame the cancer that was over, th- over three years ago. Ever since then, like all of her aging, the senility, the arthritis, has not bothered me as much as it would have, I think, because I just feel so lucky that she's here. And the aging process is like, I'm grateful that she gets to go through that and yeah. is sticking around. And as long, I mean, and she's happy. I'm not, you know, like she's, she really does seem happy and, and she's, she sleeps on the foot of my bed every night and she like gets like her little tail legs and she goes for a walk and she's, you know, still going to the bathroom outside most of the time. <laughs> um, she loves eating. So she was pretty hungry when she got back, but she wasn't thirsty. I think she found plenty of water out there. Yeah, she was in the marsh. Yeah, she was in the marsh. There's a lot of water out there, hence the mosquitoes. And um, I just keep looking at her and just being so happy that she's here. And I know where she is, and she's at home with us, where she belongs. And I think it's, you know, on the day that I do lose my friend Yukina, when she crosses over to the other side, I do think maybe this is partially preparing me for that a little bit more because you know I don't know what that will look like hopefully hopefully it won't be something like where she gets lost I, I don't think it will happen because I'm very very careful to keep an eye on her now but like I'm getting a GPS collar and all the rest but um yeah she's going on the leash if, when we go back to that land. <laughs> but um yeah and it's you know it's uh I just think it's one of those things where I'm just, I'm just grateful that she gets to be with me and we get to be with each other. And it may, I just, I can't describe how happy I get every single time I look at her. I'm just so, I'm, I love her so much and she's with her family where she belongs. And it's just another adventure that we went on together. This is, there's so much in this story. It's so beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful stories I've heard in a while. And like, I, I was kind of living this on the phone, like hearing this and waiting. And when Vanessa, when you texted me and said, we found her, I, you know, I called you immediately. I was on a trip home. I was away for that weekend and I felt it too. And I was emotional, you mm-hmm. know, I know we both have had very close relationships with animals and, um, 
I have two thoughts uh, kind of as we as we wind down in the story. The first one was I didn't know that part about your dad getting lost there. Mm. And there's something really intense to me about there's a swirling of like family stories and coming together of family because they all did something different to help you to facilitate. Mm-hmm. There was a magic in that two days of like old stories being rewritten and belief in the impossible and your inner voice and knowing your relationship with the animal that you've known since she was a baby. And you kept believing in it when no one else thought they, they, they supported you, but you, you heard it in their voices and you were trying to believe. And I remember talking to you that night and it was a heartbreaking conversation. We were texting, but you felt hollow, like nothing. You were like, I have a bad feeling, you mm-hmm. know, and I know that feeling, you know, I know what that feeling is. And I was in pain for you. And like, mm-hmm. that that's such a, what a sacred journey you went on. It was this like down into the depths and then this journey, this battle, and then this rebirth. And I love what you said about her preparing almost, maybe she's preparing you for that hard thing that will come eventually, you know, hopefully not for a while, but I don't know. I just think there's something very meaningful and magical about what happened. Can I jump in? Cause you started talking yeah. a little bit about the subconscious, I think, at least in my mind, yeah. that's what you did. Yeah. Um, so there's two things I want to say about that. So first of all, I did feel a dark feeling that yeah. night and I've never, and Yuki has run away before. I mean, she's a saucy bitch. Like she has definitely run away in her youth, but I never, you've seen me around when my dogs have run off. Yeah. Like they don't I usually run out. off. They're shepherd mixes. They usually, it's very rare that they run off, but they do sometimes. And they always come back like within an hour or two. And but actually one time Yukina got taken from my yard when I lived downtown and she was gone for four days because some neighbors took her and they oh were quote God. unquote helping her, but they never, they never tried to return her to the house they took her from. She actually had jumped out the window that day when I was at work <laughs> upstairs and was sitting in the driveway, just sunning herself. And <sighs> these people, I think really wanted a dog. They, she's so cute. They were like, I think they were secretly hoping that and she had a collar on and everything at that point. That's annoying. Um, but that was another four days where that was four days where I didn't know where she was. And that was the only time I'd ever felt that kind of feeling of like, oh, I just I need to know. Like the not knowing is so hard. And I, yeah. I know that does happen to people. Like my sister lost a cat that way, a kid, a cute little kitten. Um, and and you know, probably probably got eaten by a coyote that kitten, but they don't know for sure. And Um, that was my nephew Solomon's kitten when he was a little one. So that does happen. And, um, it's a terrible feeling, you know, of of not knowing it's, uh, but yeah, Yukina, um, besides that, every time, you know, they, they just, they always come back. Like it's no, it's not a big deal. It's unfortunate. Like I try to keep it from happening, but they're, they can be sneaky. They're smart dogs. And, um, this was different. I, I, I wasn't sure that she was going to come back. I really, I did have hope, but I wasn't convinced of my hope. And when I went to bed, I, I, I felt a little better because I had a plan. And I, but I woke up and I was having a dream. Mm. And I knew that there was a female that I was going to try to call. But I, I was having a dream where I was searching with a woman and, the, and, and, I had a, and I had a happy feeling when I woke up from the dream where I was searching for Yuki with this woman. So I, I, I woke up with a lot more hope. I really did. And, Cause I was like a mess the night before. I mean, I was barely, I, I don't even, you know, I was functioning, but I was, I was in a different state of, of being, I was just mm-hmm. one foot in front of the other, like, yeah, like empty. And that morning I was like full of life and I was just like, okay, we're going to find her. We're going to, you know, I didn't know for sure if we would, but I was, I was going to believe that we were. And, um, yeah. So that, and also <laughs> my, it's just about family. And my mom actually was like, cause my dad was like, he's wonderful, but he was kind of saying things like, you know, like I said, like she had a good life and maybe she, maybe it was her time. And my mom, when I talked to her that night, she was saying like, oh, you guys will find her in the morning. And like, I, I actually found that really comforting. So yeah. I feel like, I, and you know, my little sister was writing, she was in England, but she was writing from her on our WhatsApp group. And I just, you know, I had some friends rooting for me. I didn't call or text all of my friends just a few people. Cause I was thinking of people who might know something about trackers or 
forest things and I just didn't have it in me to like tell everybody and yeah I'm kind of glad I didn't because no you know I, I would have had a lot of people because then yeah. I, when I found her I had to like contact so many people because I wanted to let them know right away um but I, I think and you know this but this like just a month earlier or so this summer I had been in the same area because my dad's ancestors are from that area on his dad's side that's which is why my aunt lives there she lives in the old, the old homestead that's been in our family for generations um and and they so she she doesn't have children and she and keith and by the way like she was so maternal i've never seen her like that she like she held me and she was like you need to take a shower and like Wow. I just had never, I mean, I, I know she has, she's very sweet, but like I had never seen that kind of maternal side come out of her before. So that was interesting and cool. And um, she had let my sister Allison and I stay in a cabin that she has on a, a different pond, beaver pond a few miles away um, this summer and, and lightning. I don't need to get into that story. It's a whole other story. But, no, but it's a really cool story. Yeah. But, yeah. So there was a five hour thunderstorm and lightning struck a tree, a, like a hundred foot tree. So it was the same forest. This same happened. forest about a month earlier. And it, it, the wow. tree fell. This is not a limb or a branch. This was a tree fell onto the cabin right above where I was sleeping. <laughs> and my sister was, and you, you didn't even, I don't even think heard it, but Elosa heard it. Well, maybe you heard it, but Elosa was really freaked out and Yuki was totally calm. And it was one of the loudest noises I've ever heard in my life. Um, and my sister was real immediately was like, it's our ancestors. They protected us, but they're also telling us something. And she was sleeping under my great grandma's quilt. And she just, you know, we, we did this like ritual. And so there is a lot of like, and that's another reason why I put my grandpa's shirt on when I was I looking. was going to say the grandpa's shirt yeah. too. There's I, so many talismans in this story. Yeah. And she prayed to our ancestors, which she's been doing a lot to, to um, ask them for help. So there was a lot, a lot of family energy going on. Yeah. Um, with this story with me and I felt very supported. I have to say, I did feel very supported, which is nice because I do live alone. I don't really have much of a family of my own except for my dogs who are my immediate family. I mean, your family. I'm yeah. one of those people. <laughs> that's those dog fine. Babies. That's, yeah. that's a special family. I mean, that's a sacred relationship. I, there's, I feel like something got cleared or like that was about, some sort of healing ritual. There's so much in the lightning and then, and then Yuki and finding her and how you have, I don't know. I've just seen this change in you since it happened. Like something's different. And I think, and I feel it too. Like I've been feeling it too, Ooh. knowing she's okay and knowing you're okay. And I think there's something really important about that. And it's hard to put your finger on it and it's hard to say what it is, but I wanted you to tell this story because there's more to life than what you think. And in every day, there's some little miracle there. And yeah. I think this is an example of a big one. And it wasn't just you. It was energy. It was something else. It was in your woods, your your ancestry and your family. That's a pretty powerful experience. So, Yeah. it's You know, I got to experience... Well, first of all, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, and I got to experience like a agony, you know, like yep. wait, I haven't wailed in quite some time. And yep. the, the emotions I felt of like agony and fear yep. and grief at the very idea of never, never, never finding Yukina, never knowing what happened to her, having her story end this way. And also the joy, the elation that I felt. And I've always loved running through the woods. Like it's always been the most freeing feeling that I can imagine. It's just running through the woods. I love it. And I very, I got to experience this running through the woods with purpose and, and like following my ears in this primal way to find my baby and I was so happy because I had a real solid hope at that point. And I don't think I'll ever forget that, that running through the forest. And like I said, I was, I don't, I don't even remember how far I went or what, what I passed by or anything. I just was so focused yeah. on going that towards the sound. That moment when you told me that, that you were in another state 
it's almost like you were getting pulled towards her at that point. Like the little dog had helped you go in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And then you were suddenly like, and when you live with an animal that long, I'm not going to lie. I I really think that you're connected and somehow. Yeah. I was hoping that, so when I was searching for her the day before, I was kind of hoping that I could like meditate and feel into where she was. Yeah. Because I didn't know what direction she went. And I, I really credit Braley, the, the little dog, for that because she did go in the right direction. She yeah, started she off in the right direction and it could have been any 360 degrees. I mean, there's all kinds. I guess she probably wouldn't have gone right in the beaver pond, but there's so many ways she could have gone. And not, and honestly, like I can't describe easily without showing you, honestly, even showing you a picture wouldn't do it justice because unless you're out there in the wilderness with no trails, because with trails, it's like, oh, the dog will probably find a trail and go on a trail. And you just look when there's no trails and there's so many fallen trees and she's a black, small black dog. And, you know, she could have bedded down somewhere. I could have walked 10 feet away from her and not seen her. I mean, even scanning with my eyes and looking everywhere, um, the angle that you're at, depend. I mean, even within a small radius of area, to search with all of those little, like it's very hilly. It's not even big hills. It's like up and down, up and down. So many fallen trees. It's, you know, not attended woods. And there's not very, very thick underbrush everywhere. There's some areas, but there's so many shadows and, and there's quite a few rocks and there's so many places that she could have been hiding. So it's like searching is, is quite difficult. Um, it's not easy to scan an area. So she really helped. Like, like I was so, yeah, I, for some reason I wasn't able to tune into what direction to go, but, um, my mind I think was getting in my way. I was like, Oh, well, logically she probably went to the Creek, but like, I kind of had a feeling like check up the hill, but my dad went in that direction. So I didn't, I don't know if I would have found her if I had, if she was in the marsh at that point, but she really helped. She did her job. Like we went in the right direction. So Braley did her job. And Yukina did her job because she barked. And that's another confirmation that she was not going off to die. She She was not going off to to die. She She was not ready for that. She barked real loud. And she also walked. Like she took those steps. If she hadn't taken those two steps, I don't know that I would have had the instinct to barrel into a marsh, (laughs) which wasn't mud. It was actually interesting. It It was moss. It was like a thick, wet moss. But my feet squished down about four inches every step. I mean, it was really wet but it was an interesting interesting marsh now it has to be called yuki's marsh it is yuki's marsh thank you yeah that is what i'm going to call it forever um so yeah she did her job too and and i you know i don't know it was whatever we did resulted in a happy ending so i followed my instincts as much as i could but yeah, it didn't work quite like, oh, well, let me just tune in and find her. Like, it wasn't that simple. It was much more of a roundabout way of following my instincts, like getting a tracker and yeah. having support from people and Yuki doing, doing her part. A lot, of, a lot of puzzle pieces came together for this story to end happily. And I know these stories often don't, do not end happily. And I mean, Yukina is the first example of a elder dog that this tracker community has ever found you know alive so yeah I that's my favorite story of the year (laughs) and I think it really is a reminder to look for the little miracles and like sometimes lately the world feels heavy and coming in on all sides but these are like the whole reason for being alive And in every cycle, there's tons of lessons and like realizations. And every time you describe the forest, I'm like, that's what life feels like. (laughs) There's shadows and it's hard to get through and it's like a really hard hill. And, but with teamwork and like trust and instinct, you find each other somehow. And I think even when it doesn't end well, those little moments are there, but it did you know, it did. And I want us to like settle into that, that it did work out and like feel what that feels like. And yeah, I really appreciate you sharing this story with us because it's really beautiful. It's not, it does, you know, you said I sound different. I'm realizing that 
in life these days, unfortunately, I don't know if it's my stage of life or just the state of the world, as much as I enjoy the little things in life and I'm gr- perpetually grateful, I'm not always a happy person, but I'm a grateful person. Yeah. I don't think I get to feel or I don't feel like this unadulterated joy and happiness yeah. yep. like I have been feeling. Just pure joy and happiness when I look at her, when I think about it. Um, I don't know if I don't let myself feel it usually or, you know, sometimes I feel like manic energy or I'm like, hap- you know, ki- ki- kind of happy about something. But this like deep body happiness and joy is something that I don't know. I, I just, I, it almost feels foreign, but it's really beautiful. And, you know, I still... I'm concerned with the things in life that stress me out, but I don't feel them as deeply um, in the sense that they don't derail my ability to feel this joy and thankfulness for just having my little family intact. I think that's maybe what what the shift is. Um, You know, going through something like this definitely puts things in perspective, like I said. And, 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 you know, the school year, for anybody who's a teacher, transitioning from summer to the school year can be kind of emotionally challenging. And I, like I said, I could have gone in this one direction and I don't think I would have been able to show up for the kids emotionally very well. I, I was like a zombie person. But because the way I went in the other direction, I just, I have so much joy to share with the children. And it's really, it's really nice to be able to be in that place. I don't know how long it will last. You know, people say these things wear off, but uh, so I'm glad we got to yeah. <laughs> record this now. I'm sure I'll always be thankful for it in theory. I don't know how long I'll feel it in my body, but yeah. Um, really, anytime I look at Yuki <laughs> or pet her, I just feel like, yeah, I don't take for granted that she's that she's sitting here looking at me right now. Yeah, and I, I wanted to take note before we close, just that I said it already, a sacred animal relationship. Animals in our lives probably should do an episode about it. You know, they are um, really true partners in this life and they have so much to teach us. And I had this image of you, I probably romanticized it, but I had this image of you emerging from the marsh and just her little body, just standing there contrasting with the greens of the marsh and just like being like, Hey, I'm here. (laughs) There's something, um, I can't find words for it. It's just that connection. When you lose an animal, that I've went through that kind of recently, and it's mm-hmm. heartbreaking. That feeling of loving an animal and that connection that's just, it's not, you're not talking, you're spiritually connecting with animals when you live with them. It's a different kind of relationship and it's un, it's really indescribable. And um, yeah. we're lucky to have that gift that we have connections with animals. And mm-hmm. I'm really glad your family is intact. It's Thank really you. special, Me those too. two creatures that live with you. They yeah. are. And, you know, I realize how different they are. I know they're different, but not having Yuki even for a night, yeah, especially a night where I didn't, where I was pondering that this might be our life now. Yeah. Um, Elos is wonderful. She's so different. I mean, she's her daughter, but she is like, kind of has like zooms around and she's not like, a, Yuki has this dignity to her and. Elos is much more anxious and gets, she's excitable. Um, and I, it just, you know, I love having Elosa here. I love them equally, but ha- like losing Yuki and having Elosa would be, it would be such a different dynamic, even though I would still have, I mean, I guess someday that it's going to be our life probably, but um, yeah, it's, it's so different without Yuki. I mean, even though I have two dogs, you know, like they're, they're such different spirits. And I, I just wanted to, the last thing I want to say is that I'm so inspired by Yukina's energy. Mm-hmm. I, it, I think there is inspiration for us all to take from her because she's just very resolute and she kind of just kept going and she calmly stood there and waited patiently. She has immense patience and you could say it's her senility, but I don't know. I think it's partially her spirit too, because she, has always sort of been like that. Like she just calmly and strongly takes the next step forward and does what she needs to do. And she's kind of like, it's, it takes a lot to ruffle her. 
she's very solid she's a very solid spirit and I I'm very inspired by her I mean she was just standing there and <laughs> again you could say maybe it's her senility but I do think it's her personality she like she seemed unbothered <laughs> like everybody else is freaking out and she's, she's just fine. going with she's the flow like, hey <laughs> yeah I chilled <laughs> overnight yeah. I claimed a marsh for my own I think there's some point where she would have probably gotten pretty, pretty stressed out, but I'm not, I don't know. I don't know what she experienced, but I imagine that she, oh, I imagine that she was concerned, but that she hadn't crossed that line yet because she bounced back really fast emotionally. She, yeah, she's the same. I think there's a lot to learn from her. And um, now we all can. <laughs> so <laughs> Vanessa, unless there's something else you want to share, is there anything else that you need to say? Um, I'm just amazed that I managed to tell the story in less than an hour. You did amazing. <laughs> and you did it beautifully. Like it was just, I'm so glad we got to capture it and keep it for the future. And um, Thank you. Thank you for thinking to do this. I hope your listeners enjoy the story. I think they will. And um, so, yes, thank you for listening to this story and hearing – Vanessa's testimony. <laughs> um, I'm going to include photos if, with Vanessa's permission of that really joyful photo of her father and also the pictures of the little tracker dogs. Just it was such a beautiful story. And Yuki's Marsh. Yeah. We have a picture of Yuki's Marsh. I kind of like ran back and took a picture of the marsh. Yeah. I, thought that, <laughs> I thought that would be a good thing to share with people. Yes. Um, and so, uh, to close, just to share the music we use for our podcast that was written um, by Alejandro Bernard from Ithaca, New York. It's called Whimsical Aliens. And uh, this project is edited and produced by Bjorn. We thank them both for their support. And to close, uh, find those miracles everywhere. Find the things you love. And remember Yuki standing in the marsh. Sometimes. Waiting for someone to find her. <laughs> Sometimes stories have happy endings. Yeah, sometimes they do. So until next time. Bye. Thanks. Love you, Pixie. Love you too. Bye.